All right, I've got a great conversation headed your way. You might recall when COVID broke out, there were so many things that we were told that we had to do that we couldn't talk about. We're talking about the number of people that died from COVID that maybe didn't, where this pandemic originated from, and who better than Dr. Robert Malone to have this conversation with us. His credentials are impeccable. He's taught all over the country. He's been a government expert in so many times. So I wanna bring you a conversation about where we are in COVID and most importantly, what we need to be on the lookout as we go forward. Dr. Mullen, thanks for joining me today. I, I think we are at such an amazing point in time. It's like almost three years, uh, just after three years since this, this pandemic was no- brought up. November 2019. Well, you've got it seared in your head. But I think what's fascinating to me is over the last several months, several things that we were told were misinformation, were conspiracy theories, are slowly but surely unraveling. And the big one in my mind is the idea of the number of COVID deaths. Now, I, I don't mean to downplay the number. I'm not, I, there are, but, but you wrote a piece on this. The New York Times kind of come out. No one's screaming from the rooftops because it's almost like they don't want you to know. But what I don't understand is that there was a piece in the Washington Post that caught my eye. And they quote um, an attending physician by the name of Robin Drettler, uh, who's at Emory. And he said, By his estimates, 90% of the patients diagnosed with COVID are actually in the hospital for some other illness. And he says, quote, since every hospitalized patient gets tested for COVID, many are incidentally positive. A gunshot victim or someone who had a heart attack, for example, could test positive for the virus, but the infection has no bearing on why they sought medical care, right? You get shot, it's not that COVID killed you, but there's a difference between dying from COVID and dying with COVID, right? Exactly. And I actually used that specific example on Rogan, um, which was what, uh, December 31st or December 30th, right around in there, uh, 2021. Right. I think is when we did the hit and then it came out on January 1st, 2022. And I, and I specifically said about that. And of course, I got trashed for saying it. And furthermore, we had the known artifacts of the PCR testing. I think notoriously, Elon Musk did four PCR tests on the same day and two were positive and two right. were negative. The PCR test, as, as originally coming out of the CDC, um, as Corey Mullis had cautioned, one should never use PCR for diagnosis in a situation like this. And they basically turned up the cycle number. This is a technical nuance that makes it so that a PCR assay is much more likely to give you a false positive. But see this, okay. And again, I don't, it's funny because three years ago, two years ago, a year and a half ago, you would have been said that you were spreading misinformation. Now, everybody's acknowledging as if the sun came up and going, of course, that doesn't make sense. Would have been reason to have me deplatformed off of LinkedIn. But here's here's what I want to ask. Why? Because I, what I don't get is that it defied common sense. As he points out in this so article- So you're confused, you're, you, you are facing this ontologic crisis because it doesn't make sense that Correct. the government would be telling you things that were false. Why right, would they right. have but, this but agenda? See, I, so I have my theory, but I want to know yours because I believe that almost every decision comes down to power or money. Correct? Okay, that's my, and so I, I'll give you mine, but you're the expert. What I want to know is, is as a doctor, how do you get away with, I don't know, I wouldn't want to mislabel it, calling it misdiagnosing, but if somebody died from a gunshot, when they died from a gunshot, when they bled out, whatever medically you determined, they didn't die because of COVID, but yet doctors were bought in on this. Why? You just chose some key words. Okay. Um, Tell me that. Uh, you used the term bought. Um, uh, I, I, it may have just been a, a slip of the tongue, uh, you was. know, a common, common uh, phrase. But uh, so the, the normal role of pathologists in the whole medical system, which is what I've trained in, right. and I've, I've been uh, taught pathology at medical schools, including uniform services, the health sciences. Um, so uh, the role of the pathologist is basically quality control for the hospital to make sure that the hospital is doing its job, it's correctly diagnosing disease, it's correctly treating disease, and if it's not, detecting how that's gone wrong. Now, let's give everybody the benefit of the doubt. Let's say they're doing it for the best possible reasons, sure. okay? Because we're nice guys. <laughs> okay. Um, we and are. we're here in D.C. Uh, so uh, if, we, if we're going to give them the benefit of the doubt, uh, 
let's say they were weaponizing fear because they felt that it was necessary to get the public um, sufficiently fired up about the threat that they would comply with the various pronouncements about public policy in order to mitigate that threat of the disease spread, which at the time, uh, the administration was still Mr. Trump, something that you're very familiar yes. with, those events, um, and uh, so are many others that are in my secret, like Peter Navarro, uh, who tried very diligently to help uh, mitigate some of those risks. I think if, if we infer that the Trump administration in general was acting um, in what they believe to be the convincing the general public to accept uh, um, uh, threat mitigation measures, which they might not otherwise accept, like closing down their business, right. shutting down churches, uh, and all of the associated trimmings that but, we but saw. What I don't get, and again, this may just be my own naivete, I, I, I will admit that, because I, what I look at is, you look at your background, you mentioned the places, a couple of the places that you've taught, you've been at some big institutions. You were prior to the pandemic. I mean, everybody sit, sit, I was like, an outbreak specialist. I, this is I've my point though. You were outbreaks. the guy. People would go to you and say, you're the guy at the forefront of these mRNA vaccines. Tell us what's going on. Why aren't other doctors just saying, oh, well, excuse me, this, this defies common sense here. It's because the thing that fascinated me about this is that everybody bought in like they were Stepford wives. And I'm going, wait a second. I'm not a doctor. I barely have first aid training. I don't think this makes sense. And well put. And, and a lot of people um, had that reaction coming from many different disciplines. Right. Um, particularly people that were aware of uh, the ways that uh, information and media is managed. Uh, the intelligence, people familiar with the intelligence community, people familiar with outbreak response norms. Uh, epidemiologists, if you, it, and one of the, it's a complex answer. But the um, thing it's a multifactorial. Yeah. And I want to mention uh, the authors of the Great Barrington Declaration. Okay. Um, Jay Bhattacharya yep. and his colleagues, Martin Kulldorff, et cetera, um, uh, Harvey Risch, were hammered. Yes. Intentionally, we have the, we have the receipts. We have the emails from Fauci and Collins saying these guys are going to get taken out. Um, that they're fringe epidemiologists, when in fact, they're all full professors at four of the top universities right. in the world. Okay. And by the way, neither Francis Collins nor Tony Fauci are trained epidemiologists. Okay. Right. Um, so their credentials are far superior to Tony and Collins, but they are acting um, through, and you of anyone would know how massive Tony Fauci's press operation is. I went through and data mined the, um, a uh, government database for phone numbers, because uh, I know, you know, I'm a, I do contracting work, et cetera. I know how to find information out of the federal government. Um, and I counted something like 60 FTE in, the, uh, the, in, in Tony Fauci's NIAID, which is just a division of the NIH, right? right? National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease, about 60 full-time employees dedicated to managing the press of, and there was like less than 20 dedicated to managing the Hill. Okay, that's, that's right. the balance. That's the relative balance. Um, the NIAID had become extremely effective at managing message and managing press. And they did it through, as documented by um, Bobby Kennedy in his book, The Real Anthony Fauci, they did it through retaliation against journalists. So you have a situation. Wait, so can you expand on that? What, what do you, retaliation against journalists meaning that if you didn't do what he said, you got what shut out. I mean, what what they get fired? He would call people from the NIAID would call up um, editors and say, "This person, this this journalist, has got to go." So the thing that I find fascinating about this is here we are three years later. We just read in the Washington Post, the New York Times is a similar story. You've put it out on Substack, but I mean, my my broader point is the mainstream media which you can't get more mainstream and legacy than the Post and the Times, mm. are now sort of acting like, you know, oh yeah, of course we knew this, right? You know, it was a gunshot wound, we shouldn't have counted so, that. So they're, they're doing a gradual normalization of but, that which they had previously um, labeled as mis or disinformation. Right, and the, and the court 
federal court has ruled that the administration, specifically the Biden administration, it named the DOJ, the FBI, Corinne Jean-Pierre. You're talking about the recent case right, of Missouri versus uh, um, yes, Biden. Yes, and it says, hey, you guys literally silenced everybody from one side when it came to this. The thing only that I, conservatives, but only conservatives on multiple Correct. topics, not right. just on COVID. Biden's but, but, laptop, I mean the uh, the son's laptop, everything. But you alluded to this. The thing that I think is funny is that you you guys, Bhattacharya or yourself, are the people who are the experts. You have the degrees, the experience in this field. Fauci doesn't, and yet it's his word over yours. And it's worse than that because what was deployed at the time in real time was this new tool that had never, I had never encountered it before. For me, personally, as somebody who'd been through multiple outbreaks, I had never encountered anything like the way the media was managed this time. Right. And the new tool that was deployed was the fact checker. <laughs> and these astro- Which, by the way, those guys that like, basically can't get a job, so like, you can't do anything. Why don't you be a fact what, checker? One, one of the top fact checker organizations that hammered me early on, the head of the organization, it was a pop-up, AstroTurf, um, uh, used to run a garage band. A punk garage band. I mean, that's that's the level of personnel you've but got. But let me get back to my point, though. Do you think it's more power or money or something else? What is it? Because you mentioned fear. That's obviously a power thing. But but is there a, a money factor and is there something else that did this? Because this I, is one of the most profitable products in the history of the pharmaceutical industry. So let me ask you this. In all of the three years, you mentioned de- being deplatformed. Has anybody ever, in fact checking, has anybody proven you wrong? where they've said, you made this comment, you've made several today. Has anyone said, nope, not true, this didn't get shut down? Not on the specific facts, but for instance, there's this great Business Insider piece, and you don't have to crack a smile about Business Insider. Um, uh, You know, the joke is they don't actually know anything about business. I don't even know Uh, that they, apparently, they may not even exist anymore. Yeah, so Business Insider is is, uh, a uh, routine run, routinely runs kind of left-leaning hit pieces. Yeah. Um, and they, uh, right after the Rogan uh, hit the, that went enormous, Yeah. Uh, um, uh, they came out with an article in which they brought in multiple uh, credentialed scientists to critique the various things that I said. And uh, they opined that this is wrong and that's wrong and the other thing's wrong. And every th- you can go back to that article and go down the checklist. None of them have sent me apology emails for some reason. Uh, but Every one of those things that they said was now been proven wrong and I was proven right. Right. Okay. So, so what happened was that in, in real time, I was making statements about emerging data. Like notoriously, I went on the Laura Ingram show um, and I said, it looks to me like Omicron is going to be a Christmas gift. Um, and, and jaws dropped. Yeah. Um, and, and I said, because what's going to happen? And I knew the data coming out of South Africa, that what I was saying was totally solid, that Omicron was more highly infectious, cross-reactive immunologically, and much less pathogenic than the preceding strains. And I knew it was going to act like an infectious vaccine that would sweep through the population and everybody would be generating natural immunity and they would be largely protected from COVID going forward. I'm sure that's a good Christmas gift, though, just so you know. (laughs) I'm not sure how the the Malone family celebrates Christmas, but I'm not sure getting any disease. In the sense sense that the the whole population rapidly became functionally immune by being exposed to a highly infectious, relatively non-pathogenic virus. But, but let me flip this for a second. The thing that's funny to me is that all of those folks that are on the ra- I mean, CNN had a body count. Right, but that's the thing is that Wait, all which, of if, these if doctors- gonna, If we're going to talk about mis, dis, and right. malinformation, that was, it meets the criteria for disinformation and malinformation you know because it this, was politically motivated. Right, and they played this game, Fair oh, enough. well, now you're minimizing COVID. No. I just want it to be accurate and real. And for a group of people that have a hashtag named Facts First. It's just quite clear. It's quite literal. And they but, say, if you had this comorbidity, you should still say it's COVID, okay? So it's, it's, there's, a, there's a clear evidence train. And by the way, um, if you go to Our World in Data, one of the great data ag- aggregators that many of us have been using throughout this, and search uh, mortality rates from COVID in the United States versus pick your country. We're among the worst in terms of mortality from COVID as scored by CDC. And it's one of the paradoxes the government kind of hand waves 
about. Okay, we we have all these policies. We took all these all these uh, um, uh, measures, active measures, vaccination, lockdowns, etc., and yet we have one of the worst mortality rates in the world. We don't really know what the outcomes were in the United States because they can put him on a vent, they can put him on red and disappear, and what do they get? About forty thousand plus subsidy because they can check a box. The only way I can square that circle is that there was a policy put in place that uh, I'm sure for all the best reasons, um, we're no longer going to allow elective medical procedures. Now, the truth is that every hospital in America would go bankrupt like that if they stopped any all elective medical procedures, because that's where all the profit is, because Obamacare took all the profit out of all the routine stuff. Right. Okay. And so basically it's wink, wink, nod, nod. We'll let you charge what you will for elective procedures to subsidize the standard procedures that the government is paying for through Obamacare. Okay. And so that's how we subsidize. We let, we allow the the hospitals to act in this kind of public private partnership to maintain profitability. And remember the hospitals are all now all owned by investment groups. Okay. They're not like community owned by your Catholic church or the local diocese anymore. And nobody thought through the blowback, the unintended consequences, like is often the case in the federal government. I know you're probably shocked about that, yeah, too, yeah. Um, that uh, this would create a perverse incentive. And the outcome was a lot of avoidable deaths, but almost all of them are in people who had major comorbidities. Um, and it goes back to, the, um, to Wuhan and the CCP, where we now know that those images that were put out early on, remember, oh, we built this massive right. hospital because we had so many deaths. Right. We have deaths on the street. We have people walking around in gowns. We're having to lock them up. We're welding their uh, their homes shut, all that stuff. Remember all that? Oh, yeah. Okay. Masks, that, man, mass graves, mass graves, right? That was all propaganda. So, so let me get, to, I, I want to touch on this because you brought up Wuhan. Tell me what proximal origin is in its, in its tightest form. So when, when you're using these technical terms having to do with virology and outbreaks, yep. proximal origin, what you're saying is where is essentially patient zero? Okay. Where, where is the first event that uh, was associated, that we can detect, that was associated with this virus entering the human population? Okay. So when something breaks out, the idea is to look at where the origins were. And, and when COVID broke out, the idea was, there's two leading theories. One, this market, this wet market, and two, a virology lab that develops viruses, right? Uh, they're not that far from each other, but for some reason, everybody said it's gotta be a wet market. It, it's, that looks like it, and we dismiss the virology lab. But we now have this, these messages that have come out uh, over In Slack, Slack. Yeah. that show that, that these folks were literally saying, yeah, it makes sense that it came from a virology lab, but let's not go there. Right. I, again, this is another instance of defying common sense. So when the sequence, I remember when the sequence was first published of the virus, um, it's January 10th or 11th, um, and I grabbed it off the servers and started working with our team to try to find drugs. Um, uh, it was loaded as Wuhan seafood market virus. That's how it was labeled. Okay, so there was there was a bias in the proximal origin from from uh, the first moment that the sequence of the virus became available. Um, and uh, what you're talking about with the Slack channel is this uh, dialogue from Christian Anderson of Scripps Institute, who's a noted virologist, relatively young, not a uh, 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 la uh, later generation from me. Okay. Um, uh, and Scripps is a major hub for virology and immunology in La Jolla. Okay, so it's a powerhouse institution. This is one of the top guys at that powerhouse institution. He has major funding from NIH, particularly from NIAID. He has close ties with, with the whole NIAID establishment and Fauci and all of Fauci's lieutenants, et cetera. Okay, and, and he is in on the initial conversations that have to do with basically, oh shit, what has happened here and what are we going to do about it? And where did it come from? And, and he, in, in the Slack channel conversations, and there's a lot of other ones having to do with Jeremy Farrar and uh, um, of the Welcome Trust 
and uh, um, uh, Fauci and Collins, where they all got burner phones. This is in, in Farrar's uh, um, personal biography that he's published that they all got burner phones so they couldn't be tracked. They could talk about this issue. Again, where something the, that should be a scandal in itself as a government employee, that you're going off the grid to, to talk about this. But right. let's leave that so, aside. For yeah, a second. okay. So, so this is from the outset. This has been handled as a, oh my gosh, I'm being polite. Uh, what the heck happened here? And what are we going to do about it? Why would they be so secretive? That's the real back question underneath right. all of this. But to the, the proximal, what we have the receipts for, the smoking gun receipts now, we have this clear dialogue just recently disclosed with a Slack channel in which um, Christian Anderson is making clear, unequivocal statements that summarize are basically uh, it walks like a duck, it quacks like a duck, it must be a duck. Right. It looks like a laboratory engineered virus. It has the furin cleavage site. He talks about it in detail and he is building a manuscript for submission to a major publication, major academic publication around that. And there is a, a an interactive dialogue entered into um, in which he is uh, interacting with Tony Fauci and others and uh, he changes his story inexplicably midstream in this, in this Slack channel dialogue. Right. Where they're discussing where is patient zero, right? I mean, that's, that's what they're getting at here. And um, he says, he, he, he basically the argument is made, uh, we can't distinguish that it is a laboratory origin or a natural origin. And so in order to not get the public all wound up, we should say that it is a natural origin. They, they are absolutely saying we need to do this to protect China. That's, that is absolutely a truth bomb, okay? Is, is our NIH leadership is acting to protect the CCP. Now, why? Okay, that's the underlying, right. okay? So um, that, let's peel the onion a little bit. Simultaneously, there are two committees set up at the CIA to discern um, the origin of the virus. One of those committees is given, they're both given predefined endpoints. One of them is to make the case that it's a natural origin, and one of them is to make the case that it's a laboratory origin. And as they do their work, the laboratory origin storyline becomes most compelling. And Tony Fauci intercedes, he tries to stop that. Okay. Um, the, that report is suppressed, it's taken to the CIA ombudsman. Um, the CIA ombudsman overrules, gives the team that came up with that awards, okay? And um, that is why in the congressional report, we have this documentation now that um, it, despite what the um, uh, director of national intelligence said, where he kind of gave a wishy-washy right, summary, divided. okay? Um, the truth is that the committee came up with the determination that with a low degree of certainty, this was a laboratory origin. Why was it a low degree of certainty? Because they didn't have the smoking gun of the documents because the CCP had already gotten in there and right. destroyed them. And won't let anyone have real access. Okay. To so then, then you got to say, whoa, 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 why all of this focus on protecting this space? on protecting right. Wuhan Institute of Virology, protecting CCP, protecting what was going on there. It appears that it, I mean, it, it's, like I say, it walks like a duck, it quacks sure. like a duck, it looks like an engineered virus, okay? And um, uh, yet I was told explicitly by Michael Callahan, uh, the CIA officer that had contacted me on January 4th, that this had been looked at and it was absolutely not an engineered virus, and yet it has all the hallmarks of an engineered virus. And many people have subsequently evaluated it in, uh, in independent committees, including the Lancet Commission, and come to the conclusion that it's an engineered virus, which our government is still trying to deny. But even if it wasn't, right? Okay, but the, but the, these guys are saying, don't even look there. Yeah, that's right. Why, why, why all of this effort? Right. Okay, so here's the story that I have had confidential verification on that I've never, I've discussed once as a theory, but I'm now hearing that this actually has very strong merit and validity. What happened was that we had a breach of security in our intelligence community having to do with our human intelligence in the CCP. Which is, that 
just to, to be clear, so everyone understands, there's signals intelligence, which is listening in, or whatever, and then there's human intelligence, human, which is actual sources on and, the ground. And, and the CCP is not shy. They kill you, okay? Or they torture you before they kill you, or they torture your relatives in front of you and kill them before they kill you, but that's how it goes, okay? Um, and basically, our human intelligence for, for uh, understanding what's going on at the, within China, mainland China and the CCP, which has um, one of the three most advanced biowarfare uh, development programs in the world, um, uh, our eyes got eliminated. And I, I used to speculate about this, but I've now heard internal confirmation that what happened was that there was a quid pro quo set up basically out of desperation. And we transferred technology into Wuhan Institute of Virology. And the quid pro quo was to allow a limited number of human assets to have visibility about what was going on there. Okay. Okay. So the, the logic is we're in, a, we're in a bad situation. We know that these guys are doing stuff. We want to know what they're doing because we want to be in a position we can develop countermeasures for that. And so we want to do anything we can to get intelligence. And we've now lost all of our eyes. What are we going to do? Okay, well, um, we strike a deal. The deal appears to have been that there was technology transfer associated with Ralph Barrick and that whole program involving a modern advanced recombinant virology and recombinant DNA technology and, uh, and known research having to do specifically with about coronaviruses. Because if you go back in the literature, coronaviruses have been identified as one of the leading candidate agents for biowarfare for a very long time. This is not novel that this popped up, okay? This has long been one of the known uh, um, viable strategies for developing biowarfare agents. And people don't really understand the biowarfare treaty. It is full of holes. And one of the holes is that explicitly, if you're a signatory even, if you're developing incapacitating agents, non-lethal pathogens that will take out um, your opponent uh, in terms of their military readiness, that's technically acceptable under the biowarfare treaty, okay? Um, and coronavirus, as we now look at what has swept through the world, basically that's what it is, okay? It, so we knew that China was doing stuff, we didn't know what they were doing. We wanted to have eyes and we engaged in a quid pro quo that involved both funding transfer and technology transfer and Tony Fauci knew all about it. As so, did so USAID. So we give them a bunch of technology. We give them tech and money. And money. They develop all this, but then what? And then we're supposed to be able to see the results. Right. Okay. And so how does it play out? Uh, it plays out that it, it appears. So this is speculation. This is the chain of events as I see it. Okay. Right. There was technology transferred from EcoHealth Alliance and Ralph Barrick having to do with this fear and cleavage site, the specific mutations, the engineering of the virus, and potentially passaging in a humanized mouse strain, et cetera, that gave rise to a cluster of coronaviruses that were kept banked. Um, and by the way, they have a massive bank of other coronaviruses that, that is there and untapped. We don't even know what the contents are that they've been collecting in China for years and years and years. But they came up with a, a portfolio of recombinant viruses, and they were testing those recombinant viruses for their biologic activities, their ability to infect humans with the twisted logic that if we were to engineer a virus, a coronavirus, that would be enabled to infect humans that had human infection characteristics and then adapted it to bats, we could then infect bat populations and they would become immune to it so they would never evolve a virus that would infect humans. It's like, um, it, 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 is, right. it is totally um, absurd logic, um, but uh, um, this is what was proposed. It was apparently rejected according to DARPA. That's, that's, you know, it's coming out of DARPA, so I don't know what's real and right. what isn't real in this. Um, and was picked up and funded by NIAID. Okay, so it appears that there was a program specifically targeting this generation of multiple viral mutants, testing of those viral mutants, 
And the little bit of data that can be gathered suggests that the initial infected individuals absolutely did have direct contact with Wuhan Institute so why, of Virology. So when, when Rand Paul questions Tony Fauci, he says, you did this kind of stuff. And Tony Fauci says, I did Bond not. Face lies. Okay. okay, but why is it not easier to prove that? That paper trail exists. What happened at the other end has all been destroyed. So one of the things that happened was CCP went on in because this this all the the current timeline is that the crossover into human population from and it could be that they were just doing animal experimentation, you know, with humanized mice and saying, you know, what does this virus do? What does that virus do? As somebody who's worked at a primate research center that does this kind of stuff, not gain of function research, California Regional Primate Research Center, um, that you get infections. Okay, you get infections of animal care staff. It happens. Right. Herpes viruses and other things. Okay, it is, it is a known risk in doing this kind of work. Um, and you have to do all kinds of containment and monkeys are filthy. They throw feces. It is nasty business. And, you know, with mice, you can get a needle stick. There's all kinds of ways that you can get exposed. So they were, they were doing something. Somebody got infected. Um, and that became apparent. And the current timeline suggests that this happened in November. Um, there's argument about that. And there's some other serologic evidence that suggests that it could have something happened sooner, you know, later, right. earlier than that. But, but there appears to have been an event in November and the CCP came in and basically cleaned out the records and threw away the samples and did everything they could to make it so that you could never trace what had happened. I think we'll never know. It it's, uh, uh, depends on your definition of the word is. Uh, uh, you know, what is your definition? I'm not of, using the of, Bill Clinton of, version. Of, We're using I, the standard. I think, I'm, I'm so glad you picked up on the uh, <laughs> illusion. Um, so what is a pandemic? Uh, if, if the question is, will we have global circulation of a variant infectious virus in humans? Of course, it's inevitable. Okay. It's happened through millennia. It's, right. it's going to continue. But, but there, to the, the, we've had what MERS, SARS, COVID. But the question is flu. Flu. But is there another global one on the level of COVID where we will be told to shut down, uh, that we'll have to develop? Okay. So the key point here is that all of those measures um, were not indicated. They, they, you cannot square the circle of the public health response having been driven by public health alone. I agree. I mean, in instance after instance, we've just talked about a few, but you go into mask wearing all this stuff. I mean, yeah, not yeah. after the event, you know, after event, event, after event are not uh, consistent. Right. With, but that's uh, the thing that what I'm trying to get at, and you said, don't, you know, the government and the WHO, I have always been one of those people that walks into the doctor's office and if they say, you're not doing well, uh, here, this will make you better, whether it's a, you know, a, a prescription drug, uh, whatever. And I, I trust the doctor. I trust the science. Right. So what, am I wrong to think the next time that I walk in and I get told, here's where we are, this is what's in your best interest, should I doubt that? Should I get a second opinion? What is the takeaway? So, so this, the, I, I talk about this a lot. Um, the, the, cohort that I talk to most are the, those that are woken, not woke. Um, the, let's say 25% of people who didn't uh, become so wrapped up in the narrative that they can only hear the narrative. Um, and many of those are people for whom freedom is super important. Uh, personal freedom, family for freedom, religious freedom, economic freedom. Uh, and uh, they're they're all facing uh, this uh, paradox that you're touching on of uh, can we rely on what what aspects of uh, the system that we had previously assumed to have integrity what what parts of that retain integrity that we can rely on and what parts don't and what do we do about it because the consequences if you if you say if, if you go there and you say, we have, we have had a three-year uh, travel through the reality that uh, our, our FDA, HHS infrastructure in general, 
um, our our healthcare delivery system, our official healthcare delivery system, which is what you're talking about, and and you're kind of alluding to a doctor that no longer exists, right? The 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 primary care physician that would have a one-on-one relationship with you, you'd come in and say, "Hey, doc, how you doing?" And he'd say, "Hey, Sean, I'm feeling good. How about you? And how's the wife?" Right? Um, that's that's no longer the norm in medical practice. Everything has been corporatized because everything's owned by hedge funds, et cetera, okay, money managers. Um, and the doc no longer has that level of autonomy. So in an environment in which the, the doc or your primary healthcare giver or whatever, that metaphor you want to use, is somebody who is put in a position where they have to respond to a corporate mandate, they don't have a choice. You're asking these questions. Why didn't the other docs come out? The answer is because most of them are deeply in debt and they have no options. Um, and they have to do what they were told. Otherwise, they will be fired or there will be weapon. I mean, we have we have the clear documentation, thank you, Epic Times, from a whistleblower from the CDC that the CDC worked through the foundation for CDC to basically implement crowd stalking, to get on, on cyber stalking, crowd cyber stalking, to get physicians' licenses revoked and to get them kicked out of their medical practice or otherwise lose their ability to engage in medical practice or whatever their profession is, if the CDC determined that they were spreading information which was inconsistent with what the CDC was saying was truth. Right. Okay? So so free speech is so yesterday. Um, right? Uh Right. Yep. That's that's kind of where on a, where on we're, and, and, and and this has absolutely gone on hyperdrive during the Biden administration with all kinds of justification around it, starting with Mr. Obama's justification that it's necessary to censor in order to preserve democracy. Remember, right. Hoover Institute. Okay. Um. And uh. So now we're so now the average person, John Stone walks in. He's a freedom lover. He's, he's wondering, what do I do now? We've got this new threat coming at me um, and my children and my family, and how am I supposed to respond? And that, that puts, and the analogous is the young parent. This is the one that breaks my heart um, with, with this mountain of vaccines that are now all being deployed that, by the way, all are indemnified. Nobody has any liability at all except for you if your child's damaged, right? And so... How do they face that? How do you make a decision? And it, it, it is the perfect embodiment of the paradox of being a free soul, okay? Because you, you cannot uh, be free in this environment and take command of your own decisions without assuming responsibility and the con- for the consequences of those decisions because you cannot know beforehand which is the right decision and which is the wrong decision. You're not schooled in medicine. And now that the, the corporate media is gradually allowing normalization for the rest of us, that you cannot rely on government bureaucrats to be truthful about public health policy. And so you're left um, as if a trap door is opened out underneath you and you're in free fall. And you don't know what to do, especially if you're a parent or, or right. you know, or you have elderly um, that you have to give care for and you have to make decisions for. It is a real challenge. And all I can say is my heart goes out. You know, fortunately, I'm a specialist in my area. I'm not a specialist in cardiology or neuroscience or, you know, I have to I still have to rely on those things. And now I'm left going. Uh, whoa, whoa, whoa. I have a friend, Paul Merritt. Um, one of the most highly published ICU docs in the world. Um, he's been run out of his medical school in Virginia because uh, he administered early treatment to try to save patients' lives, okay? And he, he was a guy who um, lived a quiet life. Um, he describes that he would come home after a day's work, working with students and patients, and he would read the New York Times, and he would read the Washington Post, and that told him what he needed to know about the nature of the world, and he would go to bed. Yep. And he can no longer do that. He is in free fall. And furthermore, he has had to come to grips with the fact that he has learned that the medical literature is so contaminated with bias 
the things that he has relied upon as the underpinnings of his knowledge base as a physician are no longer reliable. Right. And he's having to question everything. Okay, this is, I, I, the, I, this term existential crisis, I think has been way overused because existential crisis has to do with questioning uh, death, mortality, you know, the afterlife, those kinds of things. There's the term ontological crisis. Ontology has to do with the structure of the, of the world of information, okay? And for those of us that have gone through that window, and maybe you have, and maybe some of the people that are listening are going through it or have gone through it, if you're in that awake component, you've had this, this event where you realize that what you thought was true about the government and the world is no longer true. And you're left having to reassemble what is the meaning of the world? How, how does the world work? What can I rely on? How can I get truth? What has integrity? And so for the average person who's busy dealing with, you know, how do I make a living? How do right. I pay my bills? You know, how do I pay for gas? Uh, you know, the price of cars, blah, blah, blah. Now I've got this crisis. I, I, I can't read the Washington Post or the New York Times or rely on CNN because what I see is Everything, everything is weaponized spin. Right. And, and you can't rely on any of that information. And so you're left, what happens? Okay, this is the good news and it feeds right into your new mission <laughs> okay. space. Um, it, it gives rise to new media. And, and you know, people that I, I brag that our, our tiny little sub stack that my wife and I put out has an average readership, pair eyes on, that is approaching on a daily basis CNN's viewership, okay? CNN, Either you're doing really well or they continue to do bad. There, well, it's a, it's a, it's a, yeah, exactly. It's a, it's a biased selection because CNN is, is right. tanking so badly. Um, but still, you right. know, no, my great. budget is, would, would hardly pay for three of their cameramen, right? right. Um, uh, um, Joe Rogan. I've heard if, if you if you if you read um, the in, inside corporate media um, analyses of uh, future media, um, uh, you know the insider uh, trade documentation surveys, etc., they are scared silly oh, of the, Joe yeah, Rogan. Yeah, yeah. well, they're okay. independent media in general is, and is exactly we're we're now in an environment of diversified, decentralized kind of uh, Chinese menu media. And this is what the younger cohort is going to. Yeah. Is there checking this? That, and that's that. the good news, right? It is the so, good news so, right. because that allows for a diversity of voices. Yeah. Dr. Malone, thank you for how generous you've been with your time and, and for your leadership in these issues. Because I think to your point, we need more trusted voices. I mean, that's what this gets down to. And, I'm, and I can do my part on this, but from a medical standpoint, we need people like you out there guiding us towards the questions to ask. So thank you for your time today. And thanks, and good luck with the new enterprise. Well, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Well, as we discussed, some of these social media platforms, they're not always big fans of what Dr. Malone has to say. So if you want to see the full uncensored discussion with Dr. Malone, go to my Locals page, seanspicer.locals.com, and you can see the entire conversation there completely uncensored from the social media platforms. Hope to see you there.